Okay, so um, we, have, we have two handouts for today. You got your exercise 203 handout and your exercise, or excuse me, your assignment 203 handout and your exercise 214, which is what we're working on today. I'll talk extensively about 214 in just a second, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, 203. So this, we were just kind of clarifying the, the due dates and whatever because uh, spring break really messes things up. <laughs> and I don't like to give you stuff due right after spring break because I want you to actually have spring break with an emphasis on the break part. Um, so assignment uh, 203 isn't due until the 11th of April, which is two Monday. It's, it's a Monday, and it's two weeks after you get back from, from break. Um, and so when you get back from break on the, on the 28th, nothing's due, and you have a week from that day to do your uh, laser cut model, glue it together, or turn it in. The actual, uh, the, the actual due date for the laser cut model is April 4th, Monday, April 4th. And that's when you give it to me. Okay? The, um, so you give me that model. The turnaround time for 203, though, is, is one week. So that's part of why I'm giving it to you now, way before spring break and whatever. So the, the truth is that you don't have the skills at all to do 203 just yet. Um, you can conceptually start thinking about the design of your skyscraper now. Um, but you won't be able to do the environments and the stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, this is kind of a prime point in the semester where we're going to depart from um, what we've been doing about just texture mapping, get the material, and have a white background. We're going to change and actually have a real scene with real backgrounds, with skies and all that kind of thing. We're going to put suns into, into the scenes, um, be able to pick a time of day, time of year. Uh, and see what the sun does uh, in relation to that. So this is very much about setting up the environment in V-Ray. And so the assignment is based on that. We will also do some more advanced transformations of surfaces um, in terms of how you build out what you're trying to build. And I'll walk you through those things. Um, but at this point in the semester, you really have a lot of the Rhino skills that you need for the end. Um, we're not, we don't need to learn other than when you have specific needs. There's not a lot more I can teach you about how to build something in Rhino. It's, it's more practice and experimentation than anything else. But there is an awful lot that is left uncovered in V-Ray. And so we will be doing a lot of V-Ray work, uh, specifically with the environments. You have to do the environments before we can start doing lighting. And so we'll deal with environments, suns, sun systems, that kind of thing. And then we'll ultimately be moving into doing the all-important night rendering that everybody wants to learn how to do, because that's the coolest one of them all. So we will get there. Uh, but it takes a while because there's a lot of ground to cover before we can get to that, that night rendering. But at the same time, we're already on um, exercise 214. There's only, I think, 30 or 31 total. So we're really close to halfway right now. Um, and so it's kind of a nice week to be kind of leading into spring break. And we probably will be essentially halfway when you go off on spring break, which is reasonably nice but reasonably scary at the same time. So um, we're going to um, move on to exercise 214, which is kind of a precursor to skyscrapers. It's, it's the essential first steps in modeling a skyscraper. Um, I'm not expecting any environments today, but I want you to take your time in how you model this, because we're going to use this skyscraper throughout several more lectures as we go forward. Um, this is not one where the skyscraper that you do in the exercises is going to be the same as the skyscraper that you turn in as your assignment. Uh, and if you read them carefully, the building sizes are different. Um, and I do that on purpose. So what we mess around with during exercises is not what you get to turn in. You have to turn in something different. And that's on purpose because you need to be able to do this on your own. Yeah? Same design, but it's a much bigger, taller building. So it, can it be based on the same things? Absolutely. But I'm distinctly trying to do two separate so that you have to assimilate the information I'm teaching you in a new version of the file. And that's, that's part of to kind of testing and getting you there so that you can not panic when you have to do it in 220 and come running to me, even though you all do anyway. <laughs> so um, we're, we're going to try to get you self-sufficient on this stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, open up Rhino. I'm going to get a brand new Rhino file. And it will, once again, be large objects inches.
And really, today is a lot about experimenting. So when, when I create the first skyscraper, it probably won't be the one that I end up liking or end up using. And I'm going to show you the techniques for manipulating them. And I'll show you a variety of ways that we're going to do the manipulations. I would expect today that you do several, maybe five, and, and end up deciding which one is the right one for you. Um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. The options are going to change. Again, it's about familiarity with the tools, not so much about what the end product looks like. So uh, the base of our skyscraper is going to be 100 feet by 200 feet. Uh, so it's a rectangle. And I can start in a variety of ways. Um, perhaps the easiest one would be to go ahead and create a box corner to corner with a height. So I'll go ahead and click on box corner to corner. We'll start at point zero zero. And then I'll say at 100, oops, helps if I can type, 100 feet comma 200 feet. And my height, if I'm remembering correctly, is going to be 600 feet. So I'll type 600 feet. And if I switch into shaded mode, it gives us our very generic basic building. Or you could call it the building envelope. So uh, one of the things that happens with these buildings, and yes, I will freely admit that there's a, supposed to be a little bit of a crossover, crossover with the skyscraper studio because they've been doing that for a while. So obviously, I pick a skyscraper as something that you can play around with. Um, but in the interest of kind, of kind of messing with things, I'm not worried so much today that your skyscraper is structurally feasible. <laughs> but I'd like you to have some fun. Uh, but I want to talk through what these manipulations do and how we'll actually be able to um, create pieces of a, of a building such that you could actually construct a physical model of it. Um, I used to require as part of assignment 203 that you laser cut and glue together a cardboard model. And I'll actually show you some of the cardboard models that people used to do. Uh, but I've ended up cutting that out. People didn't seem to think it was uh, worth the effort. <laughs> Um, so I'll make you make the pieces, but I won't make you actually glue it together. Um, so anyway, I have um, this basic rectangle. And if I were to turn on my edit points, or excuse me, my control points, we could see that in this particular shape, I'm really defined by only three points. So manipulating this, there's one point, there's a second point, and there's a third point. Manipulating this or twisting it really isn't an option. Okay? I could take my object and I could type explode. And then I could turn my edit points on. And now I'd have control points at each of the corners. So you can see that there are control points at each of these corners. And I could, for example, select this upper group of control points there. And I could maybe rotate like that. And I could transform this. But notice that I ha I'm stuck with a very straight, linear transformation. So if I want to get into more kind of easy, advanced techniques, I'm going to use something called a cage edit. And I may have mentioned this before in the semester, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. And I think now is a perfect time to kind of go through what a cage edit is and how does it work. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my transform. And at the very bottom of the transform menu, there's something called cage editing. And basically what cage editing says is, I'm going to build a frame around a particular object. And in the case of what we're doing today, it's a rectangular object, so it's easy to build a frame around it. If it was a circular object, it would still be building some kind of a frame around it. That frame represents a cage. And that cage can then be manipulated, and it will manipulate whatever is inside the cage. Uh, so. When I go to cage editing, there's two things, two options that I have. One, I can create a cage. And two, I can cage edit, which means I'm going to edit the cage. The default uh, when I do a cage edit, if I haven't created a cage, is to create a cage. So it essentially does both commands together rather than just making you do them separate. It doesn't matter whether you do them as two separate objects or whether you do it as one, one operation. For today's exercise, I'm going to go ahead and do them as one operation. I'll do them together under cage edit. So I'll select cage edit. I could also type in cage edit into my command line. The first option that it presents to me is to select the captive objects, which basically means select any objects that are going to be inside the cage that will then be manipulated by the cage. And so I'll go ahead and select my building as my um, captive object. And I'll go ahead and hit Enter. 
Then it's going to say, select control object. So if I had created the cage separately, this would be where I would select that cage. But since I haven't created it yet, I'm going to go ahead and create it using one of the methods that it leaves for me here. Um, I could create one with a line or a rectangle, for example. The easiest thing, I think, is to go ahead and click on bounding box, which is going to make a rectangle around the outside of my object, no matter what my object looks like. In the case of today, it's a rectangular object, so the bounding box is essentially the object. So I'll click on bounding box. Then it's going to say, what coordinate system do we want to edit in? World coordinates is just fine. And then here comes the all-important cage points. And I think this is probably the hardest thing for people to start to understand. And I'll have to do this a variety of times to, to explain what each of the options are. So I have, under cage points, I have x point count, y point count, and z point count. Okay? This has to do with how many points it's going to divide that rectangle up into. So if, for example, I went to x point count and I said this is going to be 2, I went to y point count and I said this is going to be 2, and I went to z point count and said this is going to be 3, right? the degrees, we'll talk about what they mean in just a second. I'm leaving them as the default for right now. Actually, let's do a degree count of 1 so that they're all 1s. So I've got 2 points for x, 2 points for y, 3 points for z, and an x, y, and z degree of 1. I'll go ahead and hit Enter. Region to Edit, Global, is the default. And I'm done. So nothing happened, except that I got control points. So you see up here at the top that I have four control points that represent each of the corners. I also have four control points here at the middle. The one's back there. And I have four co control points down here at the bottom. So when I divided up the x, let's get this oriented correctly, when I divided up the x, I said two points going in the x direction, 1, 2. When I said y, 1, 2. And when I said z, 1, 2, 3. Do you get how that divided up the shape? Once I'm at this stage, now I have the ability to manipulate this shape in any way that I want based on these control points. So for example, if I took these top control points and I did a rotate, and I rotated, say, from here, there, and I rotated by 15 degrees. It rotated the top of my building around that point by 15 degrees. I could take this part, the lower part of my building, and I could rotate that part as well. Oops. Maybe I'll do 15 degrees there as well. So now the building kinks out to one side for example. Make sense so far? But I don't have to be limited to rotations. I could, for example, say, let's take these two points here and here, and let's move them. Let me turn on midpoint. To the midpoint, and I can make that building get a little bit narrower at the top. Likewise, I could take these two points I could make these go out a little bit and make that building get fatter in the center. Okay, so you see I can scale, I can rotate, basically any, any normal transformations I can do here. Okay? But in this context, I'm limited because between this point and that point, it's a straight surface. Okay? Likewise, from here to there, it's a straight line. So that had to do with, remember I picked x, y, and z degrees as being 1. That means it's going to be a straight line. So between x, y, and z, it's always going to be straight. The resulting surface has a little bit of a curve to it. We can see it's actually what's called a ruled surface. It twists a little bit. But it is essentially a one degree curve that connects each of these points. If I continue on and I do another version of this, let's say at 100, not 1200, 600 feet. And actually, while I'm here, I'm just going to go ahead and copy a bunch of these so I don't have to keep creating them. All right, let me do a cage edit of this one. So I'll go back up to surface, oh, excuse me, solid, transform, cage editing, cage edit. 
Select control object. Once again, I'll do bounding box. Oops, sorry. I need to do a cage edit of this. Transform, cage editing, cage edit, bounding box, world. OK, so last time I did 2, 2, and 3, which gave me 2 in the x, 2 in the y, and 3 in the z. This time, let's do 3, 3, and we'll stay at 3 in the z. My degree in the x, I'll say 2. In the y, I'll say 2. And in the z, I'll say 2. Region to edit, global. All right, so now you see that I divided up in the x direction by 3. So I have three control points in the x. I have three control points in the y. And I have the same thing here in the center. So once again, I'll take this top section. And I'm going to do the exact same operations because I want you to see what happens to this. Let me do a rotate. And we'll go from here by 15 degrees. So instead of being angular at this part, see how it is a smooth curve that transitions through that point. Okay? Not only does it transition smooth to that point, but it flows through this control point on that side and makes a nice arc all the way to the bottom. Okay? I could take these middle points and I could rotate them the opposite direction, for example. And it's going to, again, push between those. Does that kind of make sense? So it's a nice arcing shape rather than the angular shape. So depending on what degree curvature I pick, I'm going to get very, very different results. So one of the temptations when we're doing these kinds of things is that we get into individual manipulations. So I could, for example, take this point, and I could move this one point out, and it would bulge out. Oops, that was the wrong direction here. Sorry. And it would bulge out this side. See that? Okay. Now, this works really nicely when you look, go to look at it. But if I were to actually build this in a building, this would be near impossible to build because it has curvature in two directions. Right, it's kind of like trying to construct a sphere out of individual flat panels. Like It just doesn't really work. Um, so I want you to try to stay away from that when you do your manipulations today. Um, and you can, when we ultimately unroll this surface, um, this is going to be a non-developable surface, so you won't be able to unroll it. So we're looking more to stay within the context of these smooth ruled surfaces. If you end up with something that's more complicated that has some bulges in it, I'll, uh, I'll help you through how to fix it. So. That's the two-dimensional curve. Now, I can get even more complicated. I could go back and do another cage edit here. Um, transform. Obviously, I always type cage edit. I never pick it from the menu. Bounding box, world. OK, three, three. And let's add a few more here. Let's go five. And why not? Let's go four in these. Now, I do have the ability to change the degree from two to three. Um, it's not really going to get you anything. Um, it's more likely to be a non-developable surface. It's more likely to have two-dimensional curvature to it. It's more likely to be a ball or push out one side. Um, and so I recommend just leaving these at 2, 2, and 2. And I'll go ahead and hit Enter. Region to edit global. There we go. So you can see that now I really start to have a lot of control points on this particular object. And so I can start to get creative about what's happening uh, with, these, with these pieces. So let's. Add some guidelines for me. I'm going to do a line that goes diagonally across the top here. And I'm going to take this piece and this piece. Notice I'm selecting all of the curves at once. And I'm going to rotate around the center by maybe 7.5 degrees. Then I'll take these pieces there and this piece here. And I'll rotate again around the center there by negative 7.5 degrees. And you see that while this modeling by hand would be very complicated to do when you're using a cage edit, it's relatively easy to create a shape that's something like this. Okay? So maybe I really want to start manipulating in a way that I'm not working with just a basic rectangle. All right, so let's take this particular object and let's start to change that 
Uh, and I'll use this as kind of an envelope to, to build up something a little bit different. Uh, let's see here. Let's take this. And let me do So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a building with a little bit more complexity to begin with. So I'm not doing the standard rectangular building. Okay. Let me go ahead and get rid of this. And we'll do a rectangular plane here. Vertical. Go up the side. And then I'm going to intersect this, this, and this to get those diagonal lines, which will allow me to build out this. This, sorry, this takes a little bit of time. Oops. Get rid of that piece that looks pretty good. And I need one more piece. Cap this part off there. Oops. It helps if you actually get the corners. Missing one little piece there. One more time. Okay. So I created a little bit more compli complicated shape, right? But I can do the same cage edit to this shape. So let's take that shape, and we can actually get rid of these for a second. And I'm going to make a copy of this before I do the cage edit, just in case I don't like what happens. Uh, and we'll go up to my cage edit. So it's under Transform, Cage Editing, Cage Edit. Select Captive Objects. This isn't just one object anymore. It's a bunch of individual surfaces, so I want to make sure I select them all. I'll press Enter when I'm done. I want to do a bounding box, World. And then I'm going to change these down so it's just two and two. Generally, it's, it's better to have fewer points if you can get away with it. And we'll leave that one as five. Degree one, one, and two, that's fine. I'll go ahead and hit Enter. And you see that this time, region to edit global, there you go. It created the bounding box, and we can see the edge of the, the, the cage. And so now I could take this shape, and I could do the same thing that I did to this tower. So let me get a quick control line so that I can rotate from the center. And we'll take that piece and that piece. And I'll rotate five degrees, and then I'll take this piece and that piece at negative five. There we go. And so now what, what started as a very simple shape right now has a whole lot of complexity to it in terms of how those two pieces come together. But at the same time, this is the kind of a shape that I could actually build a physical model out of. I can laser cut the components, and I can build it. Okay, because I was careful with how I created it. So the point is, I can get into something fairly complicated. But let's go ahead and take this, because I'm happy with it, and let's start to manipulate this and make it into an actual skyscraper. So I'm going to move it over here. And you see that I've gone through several iterations before I've, I've kind of settled on something that I like. So if I want this to end up being uh, a skyscraper, I need to put the floors in, because right now it's just a hollow object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the first floor. And I'm just going to create a rectangular surface that's larger than my building. And if I were to look at that in the top view, I can confirm over here that, yes, it's larger than my building, which is what I want. And I can start with 
this piece. And the first floor, uh, it actually, in, under part two, step four, I say it's 50 floors. It's not. If you look at the introduction, I changed the distances between the floors. Um, so the first is going to be a lobby at 24 feet. So I'm going to do uh, a copy, vertical. So V for vertical. And I'm going to go up by 24 feet. So that creates, obviously, I have the ground already. And then I have my first floor at 24 feet. And then my next, I'm going to do 36 more at 16 feet each. So I'll take the same piece. And I could do a copy, V for vertical. And I could do, say, 16 feet. And then I could do 32 feet. And I could keep going up at 16 foot intervals. Okay? That's a lot of work, and it's a lot of math to have to do in, the head, in my head. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'll go back to where I had this. I'm going to start with this piece, and I'm going to do an array. And it's under, I think it's under transform. Oh, it's been a long time since I did it. It is. Array, there we go. So this is a rectangular array. Number in the x direction is going to be 1. Number in the y direction is going to be 1. Number in the z direction is going to be 36. If you're, if you're a few extras, you can always delete the extra floors. It's no big deal. Maybe I'll do that anyway. We'll do 40. OK, so then it says z spacing or first reference point. So I'm going to start here. And now I need to specify what's the distance between the floors. And you can see that it's actually building all of my floors for me. So I know that the distance is going to be 16 feet. So I'll type 16 feet. And it'll give me all of my floors. And I'll go ahead and hit Enter. And it auto-saved. Sorry. Let's try that one more time. 1, 1, 40. There's my point. 16 feet. There we go. In that direction, Enter. And there's all of my floors. Obviously, I had a few extras. So we'll get rid of those extras at the top. There we go. So I have all of those established. Those are the places where I'm going to walk. Now, in a skyscraper, typically there's uh, a difference between the ceiling height and where the next floor is so that you can run utilities and that sort of thing. And this is by no means a technical education in how to build a skyscraper. We're just kind of going with generic numbers for right now. Um, but even in this room, we have the drop ceiling, and then we have all our utilities, and then we have the, the upper ceiling. Okay? So let me go ahead and create that. So I'll start with the first one. And I'm just going to take it here. I'll copy it vertical. And we'll go up 12 feet. So I left four feet in between the two floors so that I had enough room for, say, trusses and utilities and whatever. Then I'll do the same array going up. And one of the mistakes that people make when we do this array is that they say, oh, well, it's at 12 feet now. Well, it's not at 12 feet. It's still at 16 feet. It's just in a different position where we start from. So number in x direction is 1, y direction is 1, z direction, sure, it can be 40. Distance between them is still 16 feet. Oh, let me do the first reference point, sorry. 16 feet. There they are. I'll hit Enter to finish. And what did I do wrong? Got to love it, right? Probably hit Enter when I wasn't supposed to. So when they turn pink like this, you have to hit Enter one more time. Sometimes you hit escape and get out of it. So now I have the floors, the part that I can stand on, and I have the ceilings underneath. Now, it would be helpful if I spent a little bit more time organizing, and I probably should have done this first, in that I'm going to want something called the skin. So we can rename the default layer to be called skin. I probably want a layer called floors. And I probably want a layer called ceilings. Now, it would probably be easier for me to recreate all of these floors than to click through and assign each of them uh, to the correct layer. So I'm just going to rearray them. Uh, so let's do one more array. One. And my distance is going to be 16 feet in that direction. Enter. And I'll repeat once again with this. One, one, 40. Distance, uh, first reference point there. 
16 feet in that direction. Enter. There we go. So it was faster. No. Whoops. It would help if I was paying attention to my layers. Let's try that one more time. Let me change this so that I'm on the skin layer this time. And I should have, wait, hold on. Sorry, I needed to change these. Change object layer. Change object layer. OK, so let's try that one more time. It's another array. Transform array rectangular. 1, 1, 40. Start there. It's going to be at 16 feet in that direction. I like it. I'll do this one. So once again, array. 1, 1, 40. Starting here at 16 feet in that direction. Enter. So now I have both the ceilings and the floors done. So we can get rid of these upper floors. Those are the extras. And now we look pretty good. OK. So now I need these to actually be the correct size of all the floor plates. So I'm going to start. And actually, I'm going to save this first before I start doing this, because sometimes this crashes. Let's have a new folder for today. Two, two. Four. OK, so it's saved. I'm going to use the building, and I can do that by selecting the skin. Oops. Select objects. There it is. I'm going to use that as my trim for all of these floors. So I'll type trim, and then we'll go ahead and trim these floors. Now it helps when I'm dragging to do like groups of four or five floors at once. I could technically select them all at once, but it has a tendency not to, to play too nice. So I'll do small groups of floors. And now, if we look at this, let me say turn off the skin for a second here. We can see that it's cut out all of my little floors for me. Looks like it missed a little tiny piece there going down the side. Let's turn back on my skin and see if I can correct that. I don't know why it missed it, but let's see if we can fix it. And it looks like maybe it missed a little bit there too. So I'll go back to trim. Yes, thank you. Except that it might be behind and it might be difficult to see. So shaded, yeah, not going to be too easy to see. Let me go back to here. So the point is that sometimes you do need to do a little bit of cleanup work if your trims didn't quite work perfect, perfectly. On rare instances, we'll have floors that won't trim at all, uh, in which case there's some, some special kind of finagling that may be necessary. And I will help you. A few more. All right, so I think we're there. Doesn't look like I missed any on the back side there. So I'll go ahead and hit Enter to finish. And now I have my building with my floors. So if I were to turn my skin off, for example, there are all my individual little floors. And you see that while I had a very complex shape to this particular building, because I created the skin first and I trimmed it off, I now have what each of the floor plates would be in this particular building. So it's not that bad uh, to create something like this. So let me just double check and make sure I'm not supposed to tell you anything else today, right? OK, so now we need to do a little bit of environmental stuff. We're going to build a, a basic directional light, and we're going to assign materials. So I'll create a layer called environment. Oh, and I do need to add the building core. Don't let me forget. 
And we'll have a layer called sun. Well, it'll long term it'll be called sun, sorry. We'll put a directional light on it today. Uh, let me create a basic directional light. And let's see if it's gonna let me do it. There we go. There we have a basic directional light. It's on the sun layer for right now, which can be a sublayer of environment. I do need an infinite plane. So I'll put in IP. And I will drop the infinite plane on that layer. Which, in my case, is here. But my building's way over here on the side. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's, it's more than big enough. OK, so I have an infinite plane. I have my whole environment. Right? I'm going to turn back on my skin. And actually, let me make a new layer for old buildings. And I'm going to lock the environment so that I can't accidentally do anything to it. Change object layer, turn those off. All right, so I have a light. I have my infinite plane. I'm going to zoom selected so that I'm working just with this particular building there. All right, so I still need a few more materials. I need a material for the floors. I need a material for the ceilings. And I need a material for the outside of the building. So let me go ahead and go to my V-Ray material editor. And we'll load a few materials. I'll go to load material. And let me go to my flash drive here. And under glass, I'm going to load. There should be a skyscraper glass. I'm going to load that one. It's not perfect. There's actually an error in it, but we can fix that one later. And then let me load material. And I want maybe a concrete. Do a basic concrete for the floors. And I'll do some kind of a white for the uh, walls here, or for, excuse me, for the ceilings. Interior walls. Thank you. Textured white. That'll work. OK, so I have a white. So now I need to apply these to layers. So the concrete is going to go to the floors. The textured white is going to go to the ceilings. The glass is going to go to the skin. Say OK. I'll go ahead and close it. So now that I have those done, the last thing that I have to do is I have to punch a core through the building. And the core is what would contain the elevators and, and that sort of thing. So it's good, good practice to have to do this. I'm going to look at this in the top view. And I'm going to draw a box. Actually, I'll draw it over here. At 20 feet, 20 feet. You could do maybe 30 by 30, something like that. Maybe two at this size. And my height will do at 600 feet. Actually, I should have made it a little bit taller than that. Let me scale. Oops. Scale 1D. I want to make it a little bit taller. And we'll say maybe, there we go. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to explode it so that I can get rid of the top and the bottom. So it's just a hollow tube. Then I'll take these objects, and I'll join them together. And I'm going to move them, go back to my wireframe here. I'm going to move them such that they'll end up inside my building. So maybe that's one core. And maybe I'll put another core that's over here, something like that. Now I'll go back in the top view, and I'll go to Shaded. And I'm going to use this object as a trim. And I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to click this as I go through all the floors. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't quite work like that. kind of fun. It's how fast can you, right? And there we go. We got all the way through. And lo and behold, when we look down, oh, it looks like I missed. Oh, it's this one. Look, we've got an elevator shaft. Hmm. Right? You get the idea. 
So now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'll do it in the perspective view so that we can see it a little bit better as it happens. Oops. So we'll take this, trim, and down the elevator goes, right? There we go. So uh, maybe at this point, we'll do a little bit more with these elevator cores, just so that they look reasonable here. Let's add another layer for our elevator or core. And let me go back to my materials. And maybe we'll apply the concrete to the core as well. And I really should probably trim off the tops of these. They would probably stick up a little bit. Let's take this. Move vertical. And let's take this trim. And let me just put a top on these. All right, so we'll take these, we'll put them on the core as well. Change object layer. All right. So now it's just a matter of setting up uh, a nice looking view to see what this rendering would look like. So I'm going to keep looking kind of down at it uh, because my sky is black right now, but then we'll go ahead and do a render and see what happens. All right, so we're certainly getting the shape. We're getting a little bit of reflection. It's not bad. The top obviously shouldn't be glass. That was a mistake on my part. Um, but the, the point is today you're going to create kind of a, several basic renderings like this. We will then use these objects when we start doing environments. We'll start doing sun. We'll put it into San Francisco, and you can see it with its surrounding context. Um, and it'll start to look much, much better. So I ask that you create at least three buildings today. So you need three buildings rendered by the end. They should have the floors. They should have little elevator cores in them. If you want to do one, maybe make it a little bit bigger, 30 by 30, 40 by 40, something like that. Uh, if you do two, you could split them. It's kind of up to you. Get creative with what it looks like. Try to keep the surfaces ruled, which means that in between either any outside, you're going to have just a, a straight line. So this is a, an example of that where even though this curves going down here, it's always a straight line from any point across this surface. So the surface doesn't bulge. No two-dimensional <coughs> curvature. If you end up creating one with two-dimensional curvature, it's not the end of the world. We'll, uh, we'll recover it. OK, so I think that covers what we want. Yeah, I think we're good. OK, any questions? No? All right. <coughs> 